uh, to order. First item, it's the minutes of October 10th. A motion. I'm not sure I move to approve this. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second. <laughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Items two through four are for information. Do you need any further information? If I could just turn the page. Uh, item five. Small wireless facilities and monopole structures. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. So in, this, in the last state legislative session, the state legislature approved a bill that placed some requirements and limitations on how cities and towns are able to manage the installation of small wireless facilities in city rights of way. Uh, the bill provided for a six month period from when the law went into effect on August 9th um, to allow cities to revise their processes and establish fees that ensure compliance with the new state provision. Uh, Ray Dovalina, Street Transportation Director, and Keeney Knudsen, uh, City Engineer and Assistant Street Director, are here to provide an overview of the city's uh, draft code changes to uh, the, the changes that ensure to, to balance the needs of uh, residents, businesses, and neighborhoods um, with the potential safety issues and uh, visual issues, along with um, making sure that we can recover the city's costs as much as possible for the process. Um, just one one word of note for this item. Uh, yesterday, the, the city received word from the from the wireless industry representatives uh, with concerns about the proposal before you today, and staff suggests that we take no action today, uh, but bring this item back in December uh, for uh, for further discussion. But that we still uh, proceed with the presentation and discussion uh, today. This will allow us time for staff to meet with the industry representatives and further discuss, answer questions, provide clarification, and make possible changes to the draft before you. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to, to, the, to the Street Transportation Department. Thank you, Mario. Um, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, here to give you a little more specifics and details about what the item that's on the agenda today. Um, the first thing I wanted to start out was is kind of a definition just for everybody's sake of what, what is a small cell facility. Um, these are, are smaller facilities than what we would typically see as a, as a cell tower that you would see out there, a large cell tower. Um, and they are designed to be in uh, areas to be able to expand the, the wireless carrier's network and be able to provide capacity in areas where you have a high data um, use need. Um, so we've been working with um, the, cell, uh, the wireless companies since 2012 on um, a, an existing ordinance that we have in place. We have an existing ordinance that we put in in 2012 that was adopted by council. Uh, since then, we've been working with them on um, installations and how we do this. Um, typically, when you're looking at a small wireless facility, you've got antenna equipment that are um, up on a pole, and you've got ground-mounted equipment um, that include radios, other um, things to be able to power um, this facility that sit on the ground um, right adjacent, typically adjacent to that pole. In the city of Phoenix, uh, that typically we've our installations have been on streetlight poles. Um, and also on traffic signal poles. So they've been focused on, on using existing poles in the right-of-way um, that are city-owned um, to be able to put these facilities out there. Um, I would also mention that um, we have master license agreements with all, all the major wireless companies existing. Um, and for each one of the installations, we have site license agreements that govern the actual in individual installations. So how, where we are today, um, to date since uh, 2012, um, we've had about 200 different permitted installations, um, an additional 100 that are in process, and that number keeps moving um, as uh, the wireless companies look for additional opportunities to be able to put these out in the right-of-way. Um, the existing ordinance that we have on books, just I want to talk about this. Um, when we did the ordinance changes in 2012, um, it was specifically um, working with the wireless companies to come up with a fee structure that would work for these types of facilities. Um, and so this was done in conjunction in 2012 with the wireless industry. Um, and so th the basic uh, terms of that is that when they come into the right of way and use the right of way, it's not for free. Um, they pay $3,700 a year um, for each one of these sites. And then when the staff go through the process of reviewing applications and permitting and actually going out and doing inspections to make sure that the installation is safe um, and we don't have any issues because um, there are issues where obviously we have um, a duty uh, from the city to be able to manage the right of way on behalf of the public. 
Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, we have the time necessary to be able to do that. So that is what is existing for our existing ordinances. To date, we've brought in about in revenue about $930,000 for those installations. Um, and then last year was about 150,000 and to date this year 360,000 and that's the existing agreements we have in place. So the new state law, um, the, the primary reason and, and from our perspective and the wireless companies may have a different uh, perspective, but I think they see on the horizon is the move from the 4G um, network to the as of yet to be defined the 5G network, which is the next um, move of, 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 of where we see data um, and, and wireless coverage going um, for around the country. And um, the reason is with the higher bandwidths that these operate at, they're gonna be a higher number of these facilities. Um, so they wanna have a more streamlined process, as I, I assume, to be able to make sure that these uh, are able to be put in the right of way where they want to. Um, the key aspects of the state law um, that changed that um, came out uh, is the ability for these the wireless companies to put these in the right of way by right. Um, before it was by, we, we could permit them, and it was on our option to be able to do this. Not all the cities in the, in the state and around the, the Phoenix metro area have existing ordinances placed to be able to do this. Only a handful of them do. Uh, we have a lot of experience doing this. Um, but one of the other things is it provides a reduced review time, and um, from that's what the state law does is provide a reduced review time for the cities to be able to turn around these applications. And then it also significantly reduces the amount of fees, both for the use of the right-of-way and also on what staff can charge for um, review, reviewing um, applications and permitting the process. And so um, I think the one concern we had, and we, as this bill went through the legislature, we were the only city in the state to come out in opposition to the bill. Um, the reason was we had concerns about how it would be implemented. Um, but we also, um, from talking with our city attorney, and I'll use the, their language, is that we have a non-delegable duty um, to manage the right of way not for the interest of private companies, but for the interest of our citizens of Phoenix. And so that's what we are, are focused on doing um, and making sure we, we comply with this new state law. So our con key concerns um, about the wireless facility, the, 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 the bill and, and the upcoming number of applications we see is really the truly the number of applications. Um, you could literally, um, when you look at five companies doing this all in the same area, you could have thousands of these installations in a square mile area. And this is essentially a square mile area here. Um, and we just don't know how many of these are gonna be out there. Um, and so we want to make sure that when these are going out there, that we're considering how many of these facilities are gonna be out there and what the impact of that will have on our city, on our citizens um, when this goes through. The other part is aesthetics. Um, and you only have to go um, to some of our neighboring uh, states and look at some of the small wireless facilities that have happened in some of those states to see what um, if you don't do this with care and concern about what the, what will when you have a lot of these facilities out there and what they may look like you could, this is what uh, the picture up here is is, an, is a small wireless facility installation on a pole and I don't think um, any anybody around the table out here wants to see this on on our poles in the city of Phoenix and so we are concerned with the aesthetics and concealment requirements related to um, these installations. Um, and furthermore, um, the, the, I, what I included this picture in here for is imagine if you're a resident um, sitting on the uh, balcony here. Um, we want to make sure that where these things are located, it doesn't con cause um, c concern or health issues with um, the people who live in the, around these facilities and, uh, and their proximity to antennas. Um, we know that there are RF concerns out there and there's things that we can um, manage related to that and some things we can't because of federal law. Um, but we wanted to make sure that this, um, as public concerns, are, are able to be addressed in, in what we do with our ordinance. You just said health concerns. Is, has something been identified with this? Well, I, I would say that um, from a federal law perspective, there are things that um, the federal law has said you cannot um, consider our emissions a, a, a consideration where you locate these things. But there is at the same time when, when we have our workers working on that pole, on the streetlight pole, those, those antennas and, and have to be shut down um, because you don't want to have that close exposure to the RF as well. So what's the right distance? I'm sure there are plenty of other people who are smarter than me that could tell you what that right distance is. But we want to make sure that, um, that um, the distance and proximity of these things to where people are living um, and, 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 and walking around is not going to cause any necessary concern. And then uh, also a part of the bill was the, the allowance to anywhere 
over a 50 feet tall and up to 40 inches wide at the base. Um, and they can be placed in the right of way as part of this bill as well, by right. So when we look at the ordinance changes, the draft ordinance changes that we brought forth in the packet today, we've divided them up into four areas. Um, and as Mario mentioned, that we, we've received a list of concerns from the wireless industry. Um, and I'll talk a little more about the outreach we've done with the wireless industry um, in, the, in, in the last few months uh, it, after I talk about this in a second. But um, the first part of this is structure type. So we wanted to really define out what types of structures we were going to be talking about permitting um, wireless um, facilities to be put on in the right of way. Um, and so there's a list of different structures within that ordinance really dealing with whether they're city poles or non-city poles, um, which in city poles you're talking about street lights and traffic signals. Non-city poles would be some other utilities, utility companies, maybe some other uh, poles that might be out there existing. Um, so we will seek to define those out there, uh, what types of poles we'd be talking about permitting. Procedural requirements, those are the procedures of looking at you know, making sure these um, facilities meet ADA clearance requirements for anything that goes out there, that we have visibility, um, can, if we have visibility concerns and, and that, that block it, um, visibility for um, users of the right of way, we want to make sure those things are addressed, but also the aesthetic and concealment requirements as well um, to make sure that when these things go up that they're not going to become an eyesore um, because it's one thing if you're talking about one or, or a number of these facilities, but if you're talking literally thousands of these facilities in, around the Phoenix, we want to make sure that we're being a, um, good stewards of, of how we manage the public right of way. And when you, I would also mention that it's, it, what further complicates is you have five, at least at least five companies doing this, and they all do use different pieces of equipment and all different types of installations. So to come up with one standard concealment or, or, or screening requirement for this equipment um, is, is difficult. Um, because and then you also have technology that's constantly changing and uh, things are getting smaller um, but we want to make sure that we have a process to make sure that what's ever going up on our poles is something that, that the public is not going to be upset about. Um, rates and fees and I would say that the rates and fees, the collection of rates and fees that we have proposed in here, m the majority of them all do comply with the state law. They're, they're mandated by the state law so we have to follow that. There's other ones in there that go back to what I was talking about non-delegable duty because um, we, if we have to manage the right of way, we have to make sure whatever goes in the, in the right of way um, meets um, safety requirements that we, we go out there and inspect it. Everything we do in the, that happens in the right of way, we get in the process of inspecting to make sure it's safe. But what happens is if, if we don't have the ability to recover the money to be able to do the funds to be able to, that we go spend out time doing that, then we're actually subsidizing the work we're doing in support of a private um, company working in our right of way. And we don't have that situation with any of our other utility companies that we work with. We, um, all the major utilities, dry utilities that we work with, we have the ability to go out and do inspections. So I know there's some concerns from the wireless industry about those additional fees. Um, there's other fees that we have in there that are optional fees that'll make it easier for them. Because when we talked with some of the industry um, representatives, they expressed about the number amount of money that they spend to get ready for a site, for, a, for going on a poll. And they may not know whether that poll is even available to them. Um, so we, did, we wanted to be able to uh, provide some process in place where we could go out there and work with them to um, secure or reserve these polls that they had in mind so that they didn't spend thousands of dollars um, on something that they couldn't be uh, put on. Um, and then lastly, um, the, deal, the treatment of our existing facilities. Um, we have existing as we, agreements in place for a lot of existing facilities. Um, we wanted to be able to cover the situation, how we deal with those existing agreements. And, and, those, and under those existing agreements, the, the providers have the right to be able to terminate those at any time um, and remove those facilities. And then they could come back and reapply. We wanted to put something in place where they could leave those facilities up, but continue with the existing rates for a period of time and then convert over to the new rates at a later date. Um, did want to talk about the wireless um, coordination with, with the wireless providers. Um, Probably uh, before the summer, we met with each one of the with the wireless providers to talk over with them their concerns um, and to really just kind of talk with them about this and what process we were going to go forward with this. And we wanted to find out what their installations plans were, um, what they were looking at, what kind of equipment they were using, what were their, their installations going to look like. Um, so we did that, um, I think, back in June, July time frame. And then we also, um, we were going through a process to make sure that uh, as we as we define these new ordinance changes, we weren't working from from square one like many other cities were. We were looking at existing ordinance language that we have an existing process and we had in place. Then we're looking at a state law that kind of upset the apple cart a little bit for how we do things. And we're trying to make sure how do we make sure we comply with the state law, but.
but at the same time, we're looking for opportunities to be able to better protect our right of way and and the, and the public's concerns about these installations in the right of way. So it did take us a little more time over the summer to be able to put our draft ordinance changes together. Um, but we did um, work with them and, and give them out to them at the end of October. Um, we gave them the draft ordinance changes, and then we met with them a few days later um, to go through those changes to talk them out. Um, and we also asked them to provide comments um, up to even last week um, to, to if they had any concerns. And uh, and we invited, and, and, and that process, as far as providing the information and, and meeting with them, we worked with all the, the, the wireless providers that we currently do business, that we have master site license agreements with. I would say that some of the, the wireless providers aren't necessarily the installers they use other companies to do the installation of their equipment so if we worked with them primarily we would we would, would have invited them so i know there was some concern from the wireless companies about not including everyone um, but everyone we can currently work with and we work with pretty much everyone we provided an um, invitation to and if there's somebody we missed we'll, plat we'll happily um, be able to circle back with them to make sure that we get their concerns noted as well. madam chair members of the subcommittee um, we know that there are folks that should have been involved that that we know uh, would like to be involved at this point and so that's that's the reason we like to push out those those dates um, those dates on the screen are, are no longer the right ones and so uh, we would come back to T and I on December 12th um, and that would also push out the, the the formal action for the full city council meeting to to January that still gives us time uh, to get this implemented by uh, February 9th which is the deadline in the state law have you worked with any of the other sit surrounding cities so yeah. that we are, have some consistency? Yeah, yes, Madam Chair. We've um, received, uh, we were aware of, I mean, a Parad Paradise Valley was one of the, the first, town of Paradise Valley was one of the first um, cities to go out and, and work on this and get something drafted and approved by their, their council. Um, we've also um, been, been well aware there's many of the East Valley cities that are working together on this, and we've got some language from City of Chandler that they've uh, been working through. Um, so we've, we're well aware of what those other cities are doing um, and, and have incorporated in, in, at, at times and some of the things that they actually, the wireless companies have issue with or some of the things that other cities are incorporating as well into theirs. Okay. We have cards, you want the cards sure. first? Okay. First, uh, <laughs> is it Gary Hayes? There, I believe. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. Gary Hayes, on behalf of AT&T, my address is 2198 East Camelback in Phoenix. Just briefly, I'd like to thank staff for recommendation of continuance today. Uh, we are all here. The wireless industry is made up of AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, and Sprint. And, and we have all worked together to try and come up with something that would work. We do have major concerns with the proposed ordinance. We we didn't get the uh, voluminous, quite honestly, comments until you till last night because we didn't want you to get four sets of comments. So what we did is we got this competitive industry to work together to come up with something that is one voice and one piece of paper. So we will work with your staff between now and the next subcommittee to try and come up with something. It is important though to think about the technology. While we're here talking about the ordinance, the technology is important because it's, I want to say it's the future, but it's not, it's today. What we're talking about gives the best coverage in neighborhoods with the least impact on your residents. And so that's an important thing to keep in our mind as we work forward on this ordinance. We all get the iPhone 10s or 12s or 20s or whatever they are, and it's just gonna be more and more and more data and traffic going over our network. So we need these, but we need to make sure staff is right. Aesthetically pleasing, in the right spot, but we're all working on the same thing. Um, it is very important to our industry. As a matter of fact, we have uh, Verizon Market General Counsel flew out from Texas this morning to talk to you about this issue. And she's gonna go through some of the concerns that the industry has as it relates to the proposed ordinance. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, Danielle Aji. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the subcommittee. My name is Danielle Ag. I'm Market General Counsel for Verizon Wireless. I reside at 9774 Buckhorn Drive in Frisco, Texas. And as my uh, colleague here said, I did fly in this morning in order to meet with you today. Thank you for the opportunity to do so. 
As we've um, as as we've heard this morning, the uh, the purpose of us being here today is to talk about the ordinance changes that have been proposed, and I'd like to kind of describe for you in three categories the number of concerns that we have with this ordinance. We appreciate the opportunity uh, to to push back the dates and have an additional opportunity to meet with staff to talk about some of these concerns, and uh, I'd be more than happy to come back out as many times as it takes in order to get this right. We know that uh, you received uh, quite a number of comments yesterday, and as was stated, we thought that it would be useful for you to receive all of those comments kind of in a consolidated fashion uh, so that you would receive all of them at one time and see that we are aligned across the industry and some of the concerns that we have. So I would like to uh, kind of focus on three categories of concerns, if you will. Uh, the first one is around the fees and other uh, costs. The um, as was mentioned, the uh, House Bill 2365 permits specific application and use fees and right-of-way use fees, specifically $50 for right-of-way use and $50 for co-location on uh, city-owned uh, utility poles. Those fees are the um, uh, are the fees that are expressly allowed and the additional set of fees that we see in the ordinance uh, in the proposed ordinance are in addition to and we would respectfully submit in violation of the uh, House Bill 2365. There are a number of fees from site walk fees, poll reservation fees, uh, special review fees, it kind of goes on and on uh, for a number of additional fees that are outside of and beyond what is contemplated by the legislation. In addition to those fees, thank you. In addition to those fees, there are other costs that are either direct or indirect in the ordinance. Uh, for example, there is a requirement for one personal RF emissions monitor per 25 facilities. Uh, that will be required uh, an, an additional expense required of all of the providers. In addition to that, there is requirement for third party safety and best practice training to be conducted by each of the carriers or a payment of $3,000 annually to the city. That's an additional uh, expense that is not contemplated by the legislation. In addition to that, there are, are design standards and requirements that will result in additional expenses to the carriers. It, everything from shading required for single, uh, single use poles, additional screening in terms of plants and other uh, conceal, excuse me, concealment requirements for each of the facilities, those will result in additional expenses. And so when you look at all of those additional requirements, either individually or in combination, those will result in excessive costs uh, that were not contemplated by the legislation. And we know that one of the primary purposes of the legislation was not only to streamline uh, the process for review, but also to make the uh, costs and fees associated with siting these facilities sustainable so that we can continue to densify the 4G network and also prepare for the 5G uh, technology that we know is uh, soon right around the corner. So that's the first category uh, and second category, kind of the fees and other costs, and then the design standards. I touched on some of them. In addition to those uh, design costs that will result in additional fees, there are also are um, allowed under the legislation, the cities may establish objective design standards and concealment requirements. But it is a requirement in the legislation that those be reasonable. And we would submit to you that many of the spacing and setback requirements are not reasonable. We would, uh, we would suggest also that many of the requirements around um, prohibition on certain equipment being on the poles and instead in the ground space. Those are unreasonable. The requirements that certain um, equipment be on the ground does not contemplate or take into account the fact that the legislation includes a definition of small wireless facilities that allows for exposed elements. And requiring those things instead to be on the ground does not contemplate or acknowledge the fact that exposed elements are permitted under the legislative definition. 
in addition to that, the ordinance requires that the antennas be concealed in a specific type of canister. While con reasonable concealment requirements may be permitted, it does not uh, allow in the uh, legislation that specific types of concealment requirements be provided, and many of them uh, may be technically infeasible in order to allow for the best functionality of these facilities. Those um, concerns in addition to uh, some of the height restrictions or some of the uh, placement for the facilities. All of those kind of taken in combination, we would submit to you are outside of the reasonableness standard for the design standards and concealment requirements uh, in the legislation. And then third, our, our third category would be the process and timelines. Uh, as we know, the legislation provides for specific time frames for review and uh, review of these applications. There's 20 days that the city is permitted in order to let the carriers know if the applications are complete, and then 75 days for the city to either approve or deny. If they're not denied or approved within that period of time, they will be deemed approved and then finally if there is a denial the uh, carrier would have an opportunity to resubmit uh, within 30 days time those uh, provisions are not included in the proposed ordinance uh, we suspect that th the uh, city may have been or staff may have been thinking about just referencing back to the legislation for those but we would suggest that it might be useful to include those specifically in the ordinance so that there is no um, confusion as it's being applied and implemented. In addition to that, some of the other process concerns we have is around one of the specific um, provisions relating to public outreach. We know and it was mentioned earlier that there are certain um, installations that are permitted by right. Uh, installation of new replacement or modified utility poles, so long as they meet the height restrictions, those are permitted by right. Co-location of small wireless facilities in any zone, as long as they meet the height restriction, those are permitted by right and without zoning review and approval. And so in order to uh, require a public outreach, that is either the equivalent of or very close to a zoning uh, process review uh, that is expressly prohibited in the legislation. So we would uh, respectfully request that that public outreach requirement be removed. Um, and then also as it relates to the existing agreements, as is mentioned, many of the carriers do have existing agreements with the city. Uh, and those existing agreements were expressly called out in the legislation and expressly stated that the carriers would have an opportunity to accept the, t the new rates and terms uh, permitted in the legislation after the effective date of the new ordinances that would be um, adopted by the cities. And so instead of a process as is um, stated in the ordinance that would require those existing agreements to continue for a three year or five year period, the legislation would allow for uh, the carriers to immediately take advantage of the new rates under the legislation after February 9th. We would submit to you that requiring those uh, existing agreements to continue for three or five years is in violation of the um, House bill excuse me, House Bill 2365, and uh, instead to require the carriers to terminate those agreements, to take down all of their facilities, to restore the sites, and then reapply, it's, it's kind of a draconian uh, way of handling this. We would suggest that it is, uh, would result in additional cost, re additional um, time by the city staff that may not be uh, the best use of time when we know that those facilities would need to be replaced in those same locations and otherwise should have been allowed to take advantage of the, the, the new rates, terms, and conditions under the legislation. So those are the kind of the three categories of concern around fees, around the design standards, which we believe are unreasonable stealth and concealment requirements, unreasonable spacing and setbacks, and then finally the process concerns that I've mentioned. Are there any questions for me? Thank you very much. Are you sure you met with them? <laughs> Madam Chair, <laughs> members of the subcommittee, I wanted to make a mention that the, 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 the lengthy comments we received just yesterday from them 
Um, they reviewed an older document because after we had met with the wireless companies, the ones that we met with on November 2nd, we received some actually email comments after that, actually on November 3rd. Um, we went and revised our draft ordinance, and that's what is actually in the packet. So what they reviewed is a draft version. It's not what's actually in the packet. Um, so many, many of the things that um, Ms. A.G. mentioned are not um, issues or not concerns because we heard them in, in our meeting back on November 2nd. So many of the things that she, she talked to, especially the outreach requirement, we changed that um, to be a notification process. Um, and there's some other things as well and, and there as well that we made changes and adjustments based on the feedback we received from the wireless companies. Thank you. Don Isaacson. Morning. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Don Isaacson on behalf of Sprint uh, with the firm of Isaacson and Walsh located at 3101 North Central. I don't want to duplicate the com comments already made. We're in full support. Just a couple comments. Um, what's driving this all is an incredible demand for the use of the device, the mobile devices, and the new technology. And those coming together, uh, both the demand and the ability to satisfy that demand in a brand new way. The, while the, the huge cell tower, the day of those, aren't over completely, what's being done now is a much smaller, less offensive, less obtrusive technology. And so Phoenix ordinance and other city ordinances, which were designed for the big tower and big equipment, just don't work anymore, both for time of implementation and fees. And that's what's going on right now here and in other cities all across Arizona. Phoenix and other cities here have the advantage of being out in front. Uh, the legislation passed this past session was among the first of its kind in the country, setting a template for all cities here to pass uh, quickly implementing legislation for this new technology. It will be great for the residents, it'll be great for the businesses, and unlike a lot of ordinances, it is truly win-win-win because it will set up the, an opportunity that exists for Phoenix that we call smart cities. It will allow you, the city of Phoenix, in traffic management, traffic control, emergency response, to enjoy the benefits of that same technology that your businesses and ordinances do. We did not have the draft document that staff is talking about. We're glad that uh, changes have been made. We look forward to working with the staff and I can attest that we've had great relationships with staff over time. We're confident that with sitting down and looking at the uh, 2365 and trying to put the ordinance in compliance with it, that we'll be able to reach agreement. Thank you. I have just a quick question. So you talk about the old technology. This will replace it. Does that mean all those towers and big poles and structures go away and they're replaced by the smaller technology or is uh, it a combination? Madam Chairman, members of the committee, in general terms, no, but the, the newer technology, the deployment in urbanized areas will be much more of what's called small cell technology. There will still be a use in industrial areas, urban or uh, rural areas and others for the other technology. but. Uh, dense urban areas, you'll see this type of much less obtrusive technology. Thank you. Thank you. Barb Meany, did you want to speak? Okay, thank you. Do you have questions for staff? Hi. Very quickly. So, Going back to talking about existing facilities, existing rates, how did it, looking at the state legislation, how how did our attorneys feel about continuing those existing rates? Because it seemed pretty clear in the legislation we had to go to the new rates. I would I would say that the the existing legis I mean everything we've done we've done in, in concert working with our city attorney's office, um, but I would say the existing agreements we have in place, it it, it doesn't say that. That's exactly what will happen. It says that the wireless companies may accept. So that's if, if, if they decide that they would like to accept. What we've kind of said is, is and, and I would say that what we've done as well is something that City of Tartuson already negotiated with Verizon back in the spring to pay for three additional years for anything that was approved prior to February 9th. 
So it's not like that we came out of this out of the out of the uh, out of thin air. This was things that we're already working on when we had some meetings with some of the other uh, the, the companies. Um, so you know when we put it, we looked at okay, there's these existing agreements. We can allow them to um, continue under that, or they because we have these as ten year agreements in place for these existing facilities. Or we or we could um, you know have them terminate those and then work through the new process after that, or allow them a third alternative, which is to continue in the existing rate structure until a such time we'll, we'll adopt the new rate structure for those existing agreements. So this is challenging for us as a city in the sense that I, what I had heard from staff was uh, really protection of the neighborhoods and, and uh, these uh, I don't even know what I want to, I don't know what they're called, uh, cell towers uh, being in uh, neighborhoods one right after another and right after another. And I understand that because uh, um, aesthetically it may not be appealing to in our neighborhoods or on our poles. Um, however, I look at this as very much modernizing our, our city. And I look at it as, as I've been dealing with the last couple days of a water heater and the choices that I have in the sense of a water heater as to do I keep the traditional water heater or do I go to a tankless water heater electrical which is smaller and is uh, more aesthetically uh, it's prettier and it provides me more room I kind of look at this uh, argument or debate or dialogue our discussion as the same way um, in the sense of we are now putting uh, cell towers on our boxes. Uh, what I would like to see, and if it's possible, and this would be something for the industry to think about, um, if this is required and it's state law, how can we be creative enough to then provide uh, possibly these, uh, are they, am I saying it right? The cell towers or, or okay, or, or the wireless um, to aesthetically make it pretty and make it probably creative in, in, in an art way, an art form for our neighborhoods. Um, and we are moving this way and, and neighborhoods are gonna want uh, their uh, phone moving at a higher speed. The other dynamic uh, that I would recommend is that uh, in this process that we also bring in our, uh, our government relations team uh, to also be part of this uh, due to the fact that I, I find it very interesting that we're, we're once again working very silo as each city is making their, um, writing their requirements or policy that we are not collectively coming together and looking at every one of the cities because it impacts every city and how do we collectively write a policy that also meets to the needs of the needs of the industry and so I would like uh, possibly or recommend that government relations comes in and also the League of Cities comes in to help us uh, get there by February by the February date um, I'm assuming, and this is a great assumption, um, but, uh, and I probably shouldn't assume, I should probably ask uh, that, are you aware of other cities making policies and also the industry making concessions to some of their needs within, the, within their city? Because I'm, I'm, I'm asking is, it, through their dialogue, there had to be certain concessions that met the needs of that city. Uh, Madam Chair, Vice Mayor, um, it's a couple of things that the, the wireless companies just had a comment about, um, about providing RF monitors for staff or providing $3,000 a year for training for staff on safety, working around these kind of these pieces of equipment, were both that we saw when we were looking at City of Chandler's uh, draft ordinance changes. Um, so there are one things that we, we weren't even thinking of initially, but we were like, okay, if this is something that the wireless company is okay with, and I, as I mentioned before, the City of Tucson, 
the, the, the three-year agreement they had in place for existing facilities. So we are looking at those kind of some of those best practices that we want to keep. But at the same time, I'd also mention, as, as we mentioned before, the League of Cities came out in support of this legislation. A lot of the cities were in support of this legislation. We are the only ones opposed. We have a lot more experience in doing this. So I would say that in some ways we have a lot, our concerns are a little more well-founded because of we've got a lot of these in place around the city. And so we know what we're dealing with. Um, we have legitimate concerns going forward. So I don't have any problem. I think it'd be great to be working with the cities and we are already you know, talking with them and getting ideas of what's going on with as they work together as well, some of those other cities. We can incorporate those as well. Is there a standard for this equipment amongst the different companies? No, I would, and I'll put an example, is when the state law was written, um, we had a certain cubic foot requirement for the, the, the antennas that could be up to this size on top of the poles. And the, the equipment on the ground could be 28 cubic feet in size. We're not even, if you talk to the wireless companies now, they're not even talking about antenna that size or ground mounted equipment that size. And even if you talk to them, they're, they're saying about, they want to take that ground mounted equipment and they want to put it on the pole now. Um, and in the size, I think, as I mentioned, the, the technology is getting smaller, but the way that one company shields or conceals their antenna and the way that another company deals with their antenna is completely different. They have different pieces of equipment, unfortunately. And there's also requirements um, in the state legislation that requires us that we can't require those companies to share equipment or even to be um, to co-locate on the same pole. So, um, can any, you permit it though? What's that? If, if they agree to it, can you permit them to share a pole? Yes, we can, but we cannot require them to do that. Go ahead. So am I hearing that there could be a possibly, there's five, I believe, five different companies, and could five different companies be on one poll? Yes, Vice Mayor, that, that possibility. Or in, in an alternative, if you look at it, one single intersection with four traffic signal poles, you could see equipment on each one of those poles, and plus another light pole that's right next to it for all five um, at the same intersection. OK. And I guess I'm going to go back to knowing this and us being, uh, say, the leaders and have more experience. Why have we not been working with the league, even though they agreed to this, working with the league and our experience and saying, hey, there's these possibilities. How do we collectively as cities uh, protect our neighborhoods and uh, be able to come into compliance of the law and modernize our city? there's a possibility of this happening. How do we work with the industry to make sure that this does not happen? Um, that's a great question, Vice Mayor and Madam Chair. Um, I would say that we, since December of 2016, we've been working with the League of Cities and with other cities on the draft legislation when it first came out um, and, and noting a lot of these concerns. We had our attorneys, we had our technical experts working and providing comments on that. Um, so those things have been voiced and were voiced all the way through as different revisions were made to the House bill. Uh, and I would say some of them were incorporated, some were not, um, a majority of them were not. And our, so our concerns about having a proliferation of these on different things, those were, those were some of them were heard and some were not. Um, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, and, and just to add to that, I think it would be worthwhile at this point to, to take that step uh, once more, reach out to the league, uh, and just make sure that we are fully coordinating with other cities for that discussion to work with the industry as much as we can. Uh, I believe Councilman Valenzuela joined us by phone. Is that correct? Are you there? I'm here. Thank okay. you, Madam Chair. Do you have any uh, comments or questions? I, I don't. I've been briefed on this, and uh, I, under I understand that we probably need a little more time uh, just to, to continue talking it through. Uh, but I understand that there's some legislation here that, uh, that, you know, is driving the conversation as well. Thank you. Councilwoman? Just quickly, on some of these provisions with regards to setbacks and locations, have you analyzed them to make sure we're not, we're not going to end up having none of these facilities? For example, you have under N, new or modified monopoles or poles greater than 50 feet in height will only be permitted in right away adjacent to industrial zone property, which is A1, A2, and greater than one quarter mile from residentially zoned property. I hope we're not writing this where we may not have any of these facilities and then get in trouble with the state legislation. And 
I don't know, maybe we can ask Danelle or Danielle, was it? Um, what were some of the other concerns with the provisions with regards to design standards? Was it because it was vague? Did you need more purpose? Better language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was a combination, thank you for the question and the opportunity to come up here and speak again. We um, we had a number of concerns. So the, the spacing and setback requirements, uh, I would say really fall into two problem areas. Number one, by it, it was unclear in the proposed ordinance whether some of those spacing requirements are only applied to new poles as some would okay. be permitted under the legislation as opposed to all small wireless facilities. That uh, needs to be clarified. Um, many of the um, spacing requirements or setbacks were at requiring 50 feet distances between. We suggested that those be reduced down to a 10 feet distance between uh, for many of those uh, requirements. In addition to that, the um, screening requirements that are uh, imposed for the facilities. Uh, there was a requirement for certain bushes and shrubbery and other screening to be included uh, for ground equipment. Uh, some of that we believe is gonna be problematic with the electri electricity and utility companies. We don't believe that they will uh, permit or agree to certain screening of their uh, meters and other equipment. Uh, so that's problematic and concern. Um, there's a shading requirement for uh, any new poles that will have a single use. It says that there should be pedestrian uh, shading um, uh, installed along with those new poles. That, that is of concern. Um, there's also a requirement that for um, any new poles that aren't uh, do, would have to be dual purpose. Uh, that is not a requirement in the legislation. So that is uh, above and beyond what the legislation uh, requires. Um, there is, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, limitation on where the uh, over 50 foot uh, poles can be um, installed. Uh, those are subject to zoning uh, review, uh, but there is nowhere in the legislation that says they should only be permitted in the industrial areas. And so as you suggest, uh, if we were to try to meet all of those spacing and setback and screening and other requirements, there is a strong possibility that, that we would not be able to bring uh, the, the de density of 4G and the uh, 5G small cells that we would need in order to allow for Internet of Things and smart cities and um, uh, you know other kinds of smart solutions. Uh, we are that that is a big concern for all of us, both for um, the uh, the residents of the community and also for uh, first responders. If if we don't have the technology, then they can't use it. Yeah, that's a tough one. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Vice Mayor. I have a question for you. Oh, almost. <laughs> I wanted to know if any other cities uh, have e rejected or stopped um, regarding the equipment. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand. The equipment and as it's required, um, has any other cities just stopped or rejected the whole Oh, you mean have been, any other cities just said no? We cannot right. install. Right. So the legislation does not allow for a moratorium. It requires all of the cities to um, process and review applications. Uh, as as um, was mentioned earlier, the uh, small wireless facilities on existing uh, poles, which is uh -huh. generally the preference of everyone, just so you know, that the preference is not to go install new poles all over. The preference is really to co-locate small wireless facilities, which are de defined to be within um, a certain cubic volume, uh, 28 cubic volume, uh, cubic feet, as was mentioned. Um, those are permitted by right. And also new replacement or modified poles, utility poles, are permitted by right without zoning review and without uh, zoning approval. And so the cities are prohibited at this point from a just say no policy. And this um, is across the country, because that... So this is pursuant to the Arizona okay. legislation. So across the country, has any cities uh, rejected or just said stopped um, 
regarding the equipment. There, there have been cities across the country that have just said no. And unfortunately, the result for those cities is that they are not able to have the technology that we're talking about. We have not been able to build out either our 4G or prepare for 5G. Um, the response to that uh, moratoriums, as they're mm -hmm. called in many cities, is that state legislation has been adopted um, and enacted because uh, I think the uh, legislatures are recognizing across the country that in order for us to be able to move forward with our technology, in order for us to be able to modernize, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, the cities need to have a little, uh, some guidance, if you will, some uh, kind of framework or roadmap for uh, how this uh, can be done uh, so that the uh, technology can be um, installed and made available uh, anywhere and everywhere. Got it. And in response to your earlier question, if I might, about other cities, uh, we have been able to work collaboratively with many other cities. Uh, I was just on a call a couple of weeks ago with the city of Gilbert addressing some of our concerns, and I can tell you they they uh, were very willing to work with us, were very interested in being one of the first cities uh, to have this technology, and uh, I would say probably 90% of the concerns that we collectively uh, voiced to the city were addressed in changes to their ordinance that we found beneficial not only to the carriers, but also to the, to the city uh, residents, first responders, and businesses alike. So we would uh, absolutely encourage and look forward to uh, working collaboratively with Phoenix and all the other cities in the, uh, in the, uh, within the state um, to uh, address uh, these concerns. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think it was interesting last night, I was watching the news uh, about the large land purchase by Mr. Gates, not ours, the real one. Uh, <laughs> Former. And, and how he planned to uh, build an entire smart city. What I would like to see is Phoenix beating. I think uh, we continue to tout how advanced we are and how progressive we are, and I think it is extremely important uh, to all the residents. I remember when the first towers went up and we made them paint them certain color and turn them into pine or palm trees or whatever so everybody could have cell phones. Well, this is just an illusion uh, of that process. Uh, this is the future and 5G is coming probably sooner than we're going to be prepared. Uh, but I think it's very important that we work out the details on this. Mm -hmm. You know, get it in place. We can work with the industry to adjust as we go because it's going to be a learning experience, I think, for them. I think you're going to see the equipment getting smaller and smaller. That's how the way the world works nowadays. Uh, but I really encourage you to address their concerns, to get this up and running and get it in place. We might not like everything that we agree to, uh, but put in a thing, we can still be open to negotiation in the future if it doesn't work. But I know there isn't a kid on any block that doesn't want this technology. I want it. <laughs> and most parents now have the phone that checks the kids when yeah. they walk in the house, see who's at the door while they're at work. And this is just an extension of that. So I encourage you to meet with them as soon as possible to work out the details and get it back to us because I think it's very important we get this up and going. But thank you for your presentation today and what you've done so far. And I know it hasn't been easy and it's a challenge, but I know you guys can do it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair, the committee members. That brings us to Transit Homeless Outreach Team, Maria. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, Maria Hyatt's here, uh, Public Transit Director, to provide a very brief overview of this item, requesting the subcommittee's okay. approval to move forward uh, for an additional homeless outreach team uh, dedicated to light rail in Phoenix. Um, this was uh, suggested by the Vice Mayor uh, at, at a presentation on the Phoenix CARES program at a recent uh, Park Subcommittee uh, meeting. The, the proposed team would complement our efforts to address specific needs on the light rail line and around the stations and be part of the existing Phoenix CARES program that was developed to address homelessness and the related issues associated with that. And so we're we're working to, to, to bring this together along with our efforts. So with that, I'll turn it over to Maria. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Um, the, the opportunity here with the city's um, Phoenix CARES program allowed us to um, piggyback onto the contract they have with Community Bridges uh, to bring on a team that would be focused on the light rail. Um, and the light rail area. Um, so we saw this as an opportunity to address some of the community concerns uh, that we hear. Um, in addition to the efforts that we're already putting towards um, making sure that light rail is a safe and secure place um, for everywhere and the perception of that. Um, so as um, this subcommittee knows, um, we have allocated additional police officers um, who are focused on light rail throughout the line in Phoenix. Um, in fact, we just added an additional uh, four uh, FTE police officers to do that. So what this program would really do is provide a two-member team. Um, and in unlike the Phoenix CARES program that focuses on encampments, this is really looking at ways to um, address impacts of unsheltered. Oh, I'm sorry. That would be helpful if I actually moved you through the slides at the same time as I talked. So at the same time to address the impacts of unsheltered homeless um, to public transit. The, um, what Community Bridges has indicated that they can do um, with this is really, instead of it being a structured 40 hours, 8 to 5, um, they would work to identify what were the most, the best hours for them to work in order to address the issues that we see in the community and around light rail. Um, this would be very much a partnership. So this is not a, a, a one story fits all and, and fixes everything, um, but it's more of a partnership between um, police department, both our transit enforcement unit as well as the precincts, um, Valley Metro, um, the private security on Valley Metro, um, and our department also working in concert to address the issues uh, and, and be there a very visible presence um, and focus on the light rail. Um, we can work with um, transit enforcement unit as well as the precincts on any issues on the bus side that we would see. The cost um, for this program to bring on a two-person team is $125,000. Um, and how we are funding this is through our annual allotment for security. Um, we, what we've found is that um, with our private security that provides, it, provides um, security at our park and rides, that we can reallocate some of those resources. So specifically, um, we want to make sure that when our passengers are coming in in the morning and parking their car and getting on the bus, and then when they're coming home at night to get um, off of the bus and onto their into their cars, that we have security presence at the park and rides. But we have that spot between the middle of the day that provided us an opportunity. So what we're proposing to do is instead um, provide roving security guards during those non-peak hours um, and also work with our camera system. This is more in alignment with what we used to do prior to this new contract. So it, it, is, um, it is something that we feel very comfortable with um, as we move forward. Those savings can be used to fund the 125000 for this um, security or for the um, Phoenix Cares homeless outreach team focused on light rail. We reviewed this with the Citizens Transportation Commission at their last meeting, um, and they did vote approval. They did recommend um, an, an approved vote on this. Um, so today we are asking for Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee to recommend to the City Council that the Public Transit Department uh, fund a professional homeless outreach team focused on the light rail route in Phoenix. Uh, Maria, how much is allocated to, uh, I guess, uh, there's in the bond or in the, in the, in the light rail, uh, 2050, there's, uh, there's um, a, a dollar amount allocated for security or public safety for the light rail. Vice Mayor, um, we actually have two amounts. So when we were putting together the financial plan um, based on Transportation 2050, what we brought over, what was we were spending currently at that mm -hmm. time. And so that is a significant amount of transit enforcement unit um, that is brought, that is, you know, in coordination with the police department. What we also then did, though, with and Transportation how much 2050, um, oh my gosh, I wish I remember. I guess I, I guess I want to know the total amount that is uh, allocated to transit 
transit enforcement. And Vice Mayor, I will be happy to get you that number. Unfortunately, it's not in my head right this minute, and I'd hate to tell you the wrong number. So I will get back on that. Um, in addition to that base amount, which provided um, 16 police officers, six sergeants, um, part of a commander, um, municipal security guards, and police assistants. We also knew that as our system grew with Transportation 2050 that we needed to be responsible and work in partnership with the police department in our community, recognizing we would need to do more as additional services came online. So we included an additional $2 million per year to go towards security. And, and those funds um, in the um, this current year, um, this fiscal year that we're in, we used for the additional four police officers as well as the security guards. We also did bicycles for our transit enforcement unit. That was one of the improvements I think that was suggested um, by subcommittee as well as um, Citizens Transportation Commission. So each year we have an additional two years to allocate towards uh, specific needs. Okay. Thank you. The additional two million. No, just a comment. I think that this is a, a a big plus. I know I hear a lot from people about security on light rail, and so I think this is an excellent um, move to help address some of those issues. Maria, you talked a little bit about this wasn't going to be an eight to five job, mm -hmm. but then you talked about the morning and the evening at the parking rides. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, but I think perception is, is the homeless aren't hanging out there so much at noon as they are after dark. Do, are these people on call? How do you address that? Chairwoman Williams, um, I, I confused you, and I apologize for that. Oh, no, <laughs> it, it was the way that I, I phrased it. So the savings that is going to fund the Phoenix Cares Homeless Outreach Team is coming from our security guard savings. And those security guards are focused on our bus park and rides. So this will be separate with the Community Bridges Program. Um, and that team um, will be, we will be working with Human Services, Police Department on what is the best, and, and Valley Metro on what is the best time for them to be working. Um, so I, 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 I connected the two in, and that's where I confused and I apologize for that. So uh, they the are answer on is, call? They will, be, they will be identifying the appropriate times to work their 40-hour shift during the week. Um, I do not have those hours today. As soon as we get them involved, I think they're going to do a scan, talk with our Transit Enforcement Unit in Phoenix Police Precincts, um, you'll probably be talking to the council members whose districts are all in this area to really get an idea of what are the appropriate times, um, and then we can work with them to develop that time from there. Do the train drivers ever make comment on what they see? I mean, I'm there at every station every few minutes, so I would think that would be a good information source. They do have an opportunity, you know, as they run in, um, and they can commu com communicate through the um, Valley Metro Rail um, operations and control room. Um, they do have that voice connect um, so that they can let them know what they see. The operations and control room then works with the private security guards um, to be able to address issues that they see. Recently at, at a meeting, um, I was asking about the train drivers, and they said because they're located, they don't always know what's going on at the back, and they really encouraged people to speak up. Uh, somebody who's a writer in the back and sees something that's not right uh, to call it to their attention because then they can call it in and have police jump on at the next station. So I would encourage anybody who's listening to tell everybody, uh, if you see something that doesn't look right or doesn't smell right, uh, let the driver know. Madam Chair, you're absolutely right. Um, we, we, we call it, um, if you see it, say it. Um, make sure that you are reporting anything that you see. Uh, and that's one of the things that we do see is that our community um, is very more willing today, I think, than in previous years to make sure that they're making those phone calls um, to Crime Stop, to Valley Metro, to any number of resources in order to address the concerns that they might have. Councilman Valenzuela, are you still on the phone? 
you dropped off. You just dropped off. Okay, I just want to make sure you didn't have a question. I have one That's more here. question. Um, when uh, I envisioned uh, the transit outreach team, and and uh, it was because I was uh, watching the light rail on 7th Avenue in Camelback between 7th Avenue and 19th Avenue in Camelback and watching at different hours of the time uh, different uh, scenarios. And what I envision with the outreach team is that the outreach team would be active on the light rail along with uh, the transit authority or transit enforcement, um, and that they are active uh, on the light rail, jump, jumping off at different um, segments of the light rail, and kind of just moving through with uh, transit uh, security or authority uh, to then see what is happening on the line, within our lines. Um, my question about the 40 hours, light rail runs from Monday to Sunday. So how are those 40 hours going to be met with only two people? And I guess what I'm saying is I'm advocating for more than two people because our line is larger than two people to manage. Um, in particular, uh, I just think from uh, Councilman Gallego's point on 24th Street all the way up to go all the way up to uh, Councilwoman uh, Stark's area, that that's a lot of line for two people to be able to manage and to be able to be jumping off and moving uh, to the next one. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm glad that this is at this point but uh, I don't think we have enough uh, outreach teams on there unless they're working with the outreach teams on the ground also uh, on the line. So um, I think we, we need to still work on this piece uh, to make sure it happens uh, in the way that we want it to uh, coordinate with everybody on the ground that is working. Thank you. It's uh, the recommendation is for us to uh, move this to city council to fund. How about we do that, but do it mm -hmm. on a pilot project to see if one team is sufficient? That's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. You're moving that? Sure. Okay. I move Are that. You seconding that? I'm seconding. Sure. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, he's back. I'm sorry. Did you want to make any comments, Councilman? No, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I had a bad connection, but I'm glad okay. I was able to get back on. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Next is our 2018 state legislative agenda. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, Frank McCune, our government relations director, is here along with John Wayne Gonzalez and Clark Princell to present on, uh, the, the state, on the state and federal legislative agenda items. Good morning, Madam Chair, Council Member Stark, and Council Member Valenzuela on the phone. Uh, I'm Frank McKeown, Director of Government Affairs, and with me today we have Clark Prinzel, our uh, Manager of Federal Affairs, and John Wayne Gonzalez, our Manager of State Affairs. And we're presenting um, specifics to this committee, the portion of our state and federal agendas for review and um, then asking for a recommendation to go to policy today in uh, policy committee. So with that, um, <clears throat> just to put it in perspective a bit, um, the federal agenda is one that is um, more ongoing. It's um, a more of, a, a, of an offensive position where we're constantly working on grants, long-term legislation, long-term projects, and the state agenda, um, more often than not, is working on items that come to us or impact us at the legislature. So 
you'll see the nature of the two are a little different in, in, the, in the bigger presentation. So with that, we will start with Clark and uh, he will work with us. Are we starting with you? With John. We'll start with John Wayne uh, on the state agenda. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, subcommittee members, um, these are the guiding principles that we have been um, using for the last several years. As a reminder <clears throat> for the state agenda, we definitely want to un oppose unfunded mandates. We definitely want to preserve local control, uh, protect revenue sharing, which is voter approved money, tax dollars that come to the city to help pay for our general fund. Uh, matter of fact, about a third of our general fund is shared revenue. And then most important, protecting our water resources as issues uh, continue with drought issues on Lake Mead and the Colorado River, making sure that we're, we are well positioned and, and ready to react to anything that may impact the city of Phoenix in a negative way. And I will go quickly through these, but uh, from the Streets Department, we received a, a list of items to uh, update Title 34. Title 34 is a section of law that deals with how public entities can construct horizontal and vertical projects. Um, and just to go through some of these, uh, we're just trying to, the staff is recommending that we try to adjust the fee limit changes for, uh, for the, the ability to, to select architects and engineers off a list based on state law. Right now, those numbers are different. Um, um, and so we're trying to bring them in alignment. Um, and then, of course, with um, design build, that's a, a method of delivering a project. Um, and we're trying to look at different ways of who can lead it. Right now, state law says that it has to be the, the contractor that has to lead a design build team. But staff believes that sometimes you, it's, maybe it's uh, the architect firm, or maybe it's um, city staff, or maybe it's the principal that, that should lead the team uh, to complete a project. Uh, and then another thing that staff found is that there are some violations. There's a section of law, and uh, section in Title 34 that there are penalties involved with violating these sections and uh, we found that they actually expired several years ago and we'd like to reinstate those penalties if you're going to have a law you might as well have some penalties to, to make sure everyone's playing by the fairly by the same rules uh, and then again there are some deadlines that are coming up in state law um, there's some deadlines that uh, bring some of these uh, alternative project delivery methods uh, to an end uh, we have actually one uh, that is uh, going to sunset if we don't change the law next year. That could impact our, some of our federal construction pro projects that have federal dollars uh, for uh, construction. And also, just the general concept of being able to use the, the construction manager at risk. Um, there's a deadline, I believe, in, in 2020 if we don't. And so start working on trying to extend those project delivery methods because they're coming due for a sunset. And so we're trying to be proactive. And with that, if there are no questions, Hand it over to Clark Prinzel. So on the federal agenda, we'll have the same two guiding principles as we have in previous years. The first will be to promote fiscal sustainability, and the second will be to prote protect local authority. So on behalf of the Public Transit Department, we will be advocating for federal funding for the high capacity transit system within the city and especially pushing for the South Central Rail Extension and then the Northwest Phase 2 to be included in the President's budget this year, as well as both appropriation bills for 2019 fiscal year. Additionally, we will be pushing for the reinstatement of the Alternative Fuel Tax Credit. This is a tax credit that expired at the end of 2016 and was a tax credit that the City used to the amount of $3.2 million per year. So we'll not only push for its reinstatement, but also want it to be reinstated retroactively to January 1 of this year. And then for the last for the public transit is the Highway Trust Fund solvency. This is a fund at the federal level that solvency is in question. Um, we will be pushing to support legislation that would um, increase the solvency of the fund and make sure it, it in the long term that it has the funds it needs to continue um, funding projects at the state level. And then on behalf of the streets department, we'll be focusing on the federal funding model and looking for different um, revenue streams at the federal level that can be used to support projects within the department. We will also be examining the tax reform package and ensuring that there are no negative consequences to that plan, specifically bonding issues and allowing the city to be able to use um, municipal bonds as we use today and have no restrictions placed or no additional restrictions placed upon them. The Buy America 
Nebraska statutes, we will, we're looking to streamline this program. FTA and FHWA have sometimes different rules when it comes to Buy America projects, and especially those projects we're working on that are multimodal, it, it would be much easier if, the, um, if these rules were streamlined and they reflected the same in both programs. And then also local funding priorities with the discussion of an infrastructure program at the federal level, we, the streets department has a list of projects that they have that available that we'd like to see funded in that program, however it looks when it's implemented. Additionally, freight transportation. So working with MAG on identifying those avenues that freight transportation is using and then pushing for federal funds to be used to improve the transportation of freight within the region, especially first mile and last mile. Um, and then the congestion mitigation air quality. Does, oh. does that include um, the Nogales port and getting them to uh, I've upgrade it so that traffic can get through there quicker and that security is in place? Um, Chairwoman, much of the work on the freight transportation currently within MAG is within the region itself. Um, I do know that that is something we've also worked on additionally, and I can make sure it's a focus within it. Um, this topic is more of the regional focus, but MAG does work on the Sun Corridor and to that point. I, I just think it's more important as, as the new 11 happens and if we really want to increase trade opportunities, uh, got to get the trucks through. So I would appreciate if you'd add that to the list. Yes, ma'am. We will. Thank you, Chairwoman. And then on the C CMAQ topic, that is to allow flexibility within that funding so that those funds that are used to mitigate air quality are used in non-attainment areas or the areas where they can most be effective. And then there's the flood mitigation and stormwater infrastructure. As we all know, we have a billion dollar plus backlog of projects within the city. And as the government relations team, we're working to try to every avenue for federal funding to make those projects move forward. Um, yes, with regards to flood mitigation, I know Senator McCain is looking at trying to do some things along the Rio Salado. So are we going to look for money to maybe assist him as well? I mean, a lot of it will deal with the flood control. Yeah, we're, we're looking for monies along that whole region. Okay. So not only Rio Salado, but Rio Salado Oeste, and then also finishing up any work around Trace Rios and then on within the river itself, but also on the banks as well. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great economic boost for us if we can get something going along the Rio Salado. And hopefully he looks for money to assist he us. He said he would. <laughs> Chairwoman Councilmember, yes. <laughs> and then behalf on the Water Department, we will be working on federal funds that are used for forest restoration throughout the entire city, or the top, throughout the entire state. Funding for Water Smart, which are federal funds that we use on Reliance and um, infrastructure projects within the city. And then a reservoir pilot. This would be a pilot project that would take place at Roosevelt Dam that would allow us to use some of that extra space that they have for flood control since the improvements that were done at the dam that could be used for conservation of water. And then also system conservation in general and making sure we're saving as much water as possible at Lake Mead. That's the um, quick, quick presentation today for your um, approval uh, to move forward to policy today. Councilman Valenzuela, <laughs> I can't even say it. Yeah. Danny, are you still there? <laughs> I'm still here. I'm good. Thank you. Do you have any questions or comments? <laughs> no, ma'am. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Do I have a motion? Move approval. Move approval. And Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Future items. Oh, we call. We don't have any public. Um, future agenda items. Anything special? Everybody wants to add. Okay. Uh, in that case, we are adjourned. What an efficient meeting. That's how I like it. Me too. <laughs>